Welcome to the intersection of technology, cybersecurity, and society. Welcome to ITSP Magazine. You're listening to a new The Hacker Factory podcast with hacker maker Philip Wiley. You're about to discover what the role of a professional hacker entails, the different specializations it holds, and what it takes to learn and become one. Enjoy the conversation as Philip and guests unveil the secrets of professional hacking, a mysterious, intriguing, and often misunderstood occupation. Knowledge is power, now more than ever. BugCrowd's award-winning platform combines actionable contextual intelligence with the skill and experience of the world's most elite hackers to help leading organizations identify and fix vulnerabilities, protect customers, and make the digitally connected world a safer place. Learn more at bugcrowd.com. Hello and welcome to another episode of the Hacker Factory Podcast. I'm your host, the hacker maker, Philip Wiley. In each episode, I have a unique guest sharing their story of how they got started in the industry. And hopefully these stories will help you, encourage you, or help you get started in the industry. And today I'm very excited to have uh, Daryl on with us. Daryl Baker was recommended from a friend and uh, former podcast guest, uh, Christoph, that was on here a while back. And so uh, he gave me a good tip. So fortunately, we we have a good guest this week. And it's kind of nice to get guests on that I don't know about because most of the time I'm pulling from people I know from the community. I see them on on social media or find them through conferences. So it's always good to get, you know, someone recommended from a friend or referred to by someone else because they usually bring something in totally new and and always have some some good advice and stories and experience to share. So thanks for joining. Well, thanks for having me. Uh, I was actually very excited uh, when this opportunity popped up. So I'm really excited to be here. Well, I appreciate you taking time out of your busy schedule and, and doing this last minute. So it's it's kind of interesting the way this goes. Sometimes I'll get like a batch of podcasts done, and then uh, once they're out, then it's back to finding people. So uh, you know, it's it's good when this when the show started, we were mainly focusing on people that were doing pen testing, but with a lot of things I do, you know, I don't know why I don't think these things out more sometimes. But you know, you think about you know the Hacker Factory podcast, the the idea of it was about offensive security, but there's so many different other areas in security and the listeners have, you know, various interests and stuff. So it's always good. So uh, why don't you share a little bit about yourself, kind of uh, share how you got started and, and what you're doing now? Uh, yeah. So um, my name is Daryl Baker. Uh, currently, I am a security consultant for uh, Trimark. Um, I work with Sean Metcalf. Uh, we do a lot of Active Directory assessments. So I'm on the identity team. And uh, I specialize in Microsoft identity as well as um, Active Directory identity and um, Active Directory threat emulation. So I do a lot of purple teaming. I do a lot of uh, labs and simulation, um, do a lot of testing and research for uh, the latest vulnerabilities inside of Active Directory. Um, that transition uh, was, a, was a long and interesting one. Um, originally, I think, you know, when I, when I became an adult, I guess I should say, you know, graduating high school, don't really know what you want to do. Um, I went to the military. I was in the military for 12 years, combat arms. I was a tanker, the pistol instructor. Um, and it was in my second tour in Iraq that I had a really good friend of mine who was in uh, communications. And, uh, you know, he's, he's studying for CCNA. I have no idea what it is, but he's like, hey, man, read this book. It's, it's how the Internet works, you know. So, you know, I'm flipping through it. We've got nothing else to do in our, di- our um, downtime. And uh, it, was, it was pretty interesting. I got, I got hooked. And um, I knew it's what I wanted to do got an opportunity to work in the network operations center um, right before the end of that tour. And uh, so like when I came back, got out of the military, um, I had a very kind of traditional um, IT archway, I guess we'll say uh, after that um, did break fix with Best Buy geek squad, then moved on to a help desk, the network admin systems, admin data center manager. Um, you know, so uh, I've, I've pretty much touched every IT job that there is from running cable um, and, and actually some really unique places because I've worked in, in, at an aquarium. I've worked at a very small university. So I got to see some really interesting things that you wouldn't necessarily see. Um, but the, the transition into security is uh, always 
hard and unique for everybody. So I knew from the very beginning that uh, I wanted to be in security. Uh, what I didn't know is really what that meant. Uh, you know, cause you don't know what you don't know. You watch movies, you hear stories and things sound cool. But what I did know is I don't know how any of this stuff worked. So for me, what made sense was to try to absorb as much information as I could from all the sources that I could. Uh, like I said, I had a good friend of mine. He was kind of a mentor in the early days as to uh, telling me about, you know, CompTIA certifications and, um, you know, hey, you can just go out and buy these books that tell you exactly how this works. And, and you can walk into a job interview and just just ace it. You don't, you don't have to go to a school. You don't have to sit in a class. I mean, if you learn well on your own, you can absolutely go and do that. So that absolutely opened up a, a different world as far as uh, like career trajectory, because I was able to sit down and like actually plan out. All right. So I want to learn this by this point. Um, once you learn A, then you realize you don't know anything about B. So then you sit down, you do it again, you reassess and you, okay, well, I, I want to learn B by this point and then C and D and, and that's how it goes, you know, um, constantly learning, constantly learning. Um, so from the very beginning, I was getting certifications. So COVID hits, I'm a, I'm a data center manager and um, I had actually watched a, uh, a webcast about Active Directory security. Um, you know, it's been a hot subject over the last few years, so I was keeping up with it. I had a very unique Active Directory environment that I was in charge of at the time. So um, watch, watch this webcast. It was really, really good, really informative. Um, the guy who, who was actually speaking on the webcast put out his LinkedIn information um, at the end of it. So I just, you know, added him. You know, no, no big deal. Just going to follow him, see what kind of content he puts out. So I don't know, six, seven months later, there he is on LinkedIn saying, hey, we're, you know, we're hiring. We're looking for people that know Active Directory really, really well. Uh, you don't have to be a security guru. Uh, we really want people that know Active Directory. We can teach you security. We, it's much harder to teach you this, this big framework that has so many you know, different combinations and options. Um, so, I mean, I reached out to him instantly on LinkedIn. I was like, hey, here's, you know, here's my resume. I watched your webcast. I thought it was awesome. You know? um, so I think I was in an interview two days after that. And I was hired like six days after that. And uh, it was a very small French company uh, doing some really cool proprietary security stuff with Active Directory and ingesting data in very uh, like unique ways. Um, and I was, I was the second person in the United States working for that company. And I was the first technical person. So um, I did everything from a technical level uh, for that company in the United States with this product. So that was everything from maintaining that product to uh, building solutions for customers, building out custom scripts, building out, you know, all kinds of different things that we needed uh, in order to make that, that flow work. Um, so for, you know, for probably a year, it's just kind of the two of us rocking that and expanding business in the U S and um, uh, we get acquired by a large cybersecurity company. You know, that's, that's the dream. That's you, you pop champagne, you know, like we, we made it. Um, and it was, it was great. Honestly, for me, I really liked, I liked the small company and, uh, you know, I found that out, uh, the big companies are great, but, uh, and some people love that. It was just too many moving parts for me, too many moving pieces. And, um, I missed the flexibility to kind of just kind of build on my own and, and kind of create things. Uh, so I was, um, at hackers teaching hackers, I created the, um, Active Directory Hacking Village. So um, I'm, a, I'm the original creator of uh, 80 Hacking Village. We've been doing it for a while now, and it's a really cool simulation. Um, I'll actually be at a few different conferences this year with it. Uh, so blue team conferences, usually it's set up in a way that uh, blue teamers can sit down and uh, make different adjustments to Active Directory, and there's some automated attacks that have just constantly just slam um, AD. If it's a red team conference, it's, it's the opposite. Um, and so you can do all kinds of things with Kali Linux and try to attack uh, AD and AD is going to put up all kinds of different defenses and stuff to, uh, to both detect you and, and then uh, stop those attackers. And then we have what I call beast mode, uh, which is a show mode uh, to whereas I can let these scripts go and they're automated and I have no idea who's going to win. It's just it's just red versus blue. And you can just watch the simulations just go to town across your event logs. It's actually very cool uh, to see happen. And sometimes you get some interesting uh, results, you know, when you just like, Computers do what they do. So, um, so I was doing that, and uh, that's where I ran into Sean Metcalf, and we had a good conversation about you know eighty security, and and I, I've been there ever since. So that's 
that's kind of my story in a, in a nutshell um, as to how I got to where I was at right now. But in, in that, to be clear, you know, in that first conversation that I had and, um, you know, I had those interviews with that small French company. By the time I sat down and had that interview, even though this was my first interview with a security company, I had already had my CISSP at the time, I had CCNA, I had Network Plus, as well as uh, Security Plus and A Plus. So um, I had a few, I had a few um, certifications under my belt, as well as about nine years of IT administration, as well as you know managing an entire data center virtualization. And, you know, so it it wasn't like I, I came in fresh out of college, just kind of with um, you know this theoretical knowledge, but but no hands on experience. Um, so yeah, that's, that's really my story and how I came to be where I am today. Well, that's, that's an awesome background. And I think that's, in my opinion, that's, that's the, the great way to get in because a lot of times people trying to get into security, although it's a very, very important piece, they don't realize how small of a part it is of the overall technology, because you figure just how active directory works and all that stuff, security is part of that. So you know, like them wanting to hire someone that knew a lot of Active Directory, that's smart because to try to come in and teach Active Directory to someone that has a security background, that's going to be difficult. Yep. So one thing for, yeah. for listeners to keep in mind out there. Yeah, for sure. And I have, at this point, I've trained, um, I would say probably close to a thousand um, people. This is admins, engineers, consultants on um, both Active Directory security specifically, as well as um, Active Directory but um, I can't tell you the amount of time that we spend on just Active Directory fundamentals, you know, because I'll sit in a room with a bunch of, um, you know, red teamers or former pen testers, and these guys spend 80% of their time on Linux boxes, and they know some well-known exploits for Windows. Um, you know, they, they'll dump ntds.dit, you know, you know the old volume shadow copy trick. But when, when we start talking about um, different methods in order to access LSAS remotely and things like that, the, you know, they're not necessarily thinking about these things because uh, the new, kind of the new methodology for attacking Active Directory anyway is not really being so loud and breaking things. It's using existing mechanisms that are there uh, just in ways that they weren't intended to be used, you know, um, and that makes it very hard for the blue teamers to stop that because, uh, you know, those mechanisms are there for that reason, you know, so uh, it's, it's kind of a different mentality, but we spend way more time just talking about like what is Active Directory. Uh, what are security groups? What's a security principle? Like, how do these trusts work? Um, I have I have a couple of talks this year on delegations um, because there's a there's a lot of attacks that are coming out with uh, against Active Directory right, right now. Um, Curve Relay Up is a really big one, um, and it's <laughs> delegations are at the heart of it, uh, especially um, resource based constrained delegations. And the thing about it is, it's a very dense subject. And not a lot of people understand exactly how it works and the nuances of it. Um, but the more that we talk about it and the more that, that you know, we can understand it, both the admins as well as, um, you know, the adversarial emulators uh, can, can do a better job at, at uh, creating defenses against, it, you know, some of these attacks. Because uh, we're, we're just doing, you know, as we move forward, um, you know, we're just expanding that attack surface, right? The things that we used to do on premise that were stuck on premise are now expanding into the cloud. You know, they used to be two separate things. And now we keep, now we're creating these gateways and these bridges, right? And uh, we're allowing these old protocols that we know have weaknesses, you know, known, known weaknesses that have been there for years uh, to bridge across and bridge those gaps between these two environments, you know? So um, it's, it's really interesting to see, uh, you know, that kind of a change uh, as, as we move forward. Yeah, that's very cool because it's kind of interesting because when when I moved over from AppSec into pen testing back in 2012, there really weren't the Active Directory attacks out there. You're kind of mentioning how people using the old type of uh, Windows attacks, and that was pretty much what was there. And then it's interesting how the, the uh, industries evolved due to more of the knowledge of how to attack Active Directory as well as, you know, the the rise of PowerShell because, you know, PowerShell has become a really popular tool for pen testing and for malicious activities. Yep. Yep. 100%. Yeah. I mean, you, you've got to realize that uh, uh, at the heart of a lot of these attacks, you know, we're attacking some of these protocols are 40 years old. 
uh, some of the most modern changes to these protocols are 10 years old, you know? Uh, so there, there's, there's a lot of opportunity um, if you're looking for it. Yeah, that's great. So for, for our listeners, could you explain what Active Directory is? Sure. Um, so Active Directory is a directory service, and uh, essentially it's a, it's a large database, and it holds information about all of your, your user objects and your computer objects uh, inside of an enterprise. So um, whenever you know, you've ever gotten some credentials, maybe from your job, maybe from your school, where you had a username and a password, you're able to log into every single computer um, you know, on that campus, Active Directory was probably running in the background. So it knows your account, it knows your username, it knows your password and does some validation in the background to, to make sure that you're you. And then uh, it makes sure that when you log into that computer, you're restricted to only the things that you have the permissions to have access to. Um, there are a lot of different things that you can do beyond just that, but that, that's kind of what it is in, in a nutshell. It, it keeps, uh, it verifies who you are on the network and what you have permissions to. Yeah. And the cool thing about it is I started out as a sysadmin back in 97. So uh, I used to work with Windows NT 4.0. And then I remember when Active Directory come out, it's just so much easier to minister things with Active Directory because before you'd have to go to set up accounts on every different machine and trying to manage all that was a big hassle. And at the time, Novell Netware was, you know, kind of the predominant network operating system because they had their uh, Novell directory services that people are using, which is now end up, well, I don't know, not sure if it's still around, but it evolved into e directory. But that was like, wasn't the first because you had Banyan Vines before them, but it was like the one that really caught on. And, and Microsoft kind of uh, was smart by, in, you know, implementing their own directory services. Yep. Yeah. 100 and 100 percent. And it's it's based on um, X.500. So it's it's same old directory services. Um, they've just put some nice wrappers around it. But um, just how you said, it, it's very easy, especially compared to some of the older directory services. That's kind of where the issue you know, lies. Um, so after directory out of the box, let's say it's 15 clicks, right? So you say you want to enable active directory directory services on your server. Uh, you hit next, you say, what do you want to call your domain? Mydomain.com. And basically from there, you can just hit next, 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 next. And boom, you have a domain. It'll, it'll restart and you're good to go. You've got an, an, a domain controller, you've got a domain, you've got DNS that's there and you're good to go. Uh, the problem is you've also got about 20 out of the box vulnerabilities, right? So if you're not aware of the fact that out of the box, uh, Active Directory is, is vulnerable, um, you don't have to know that. You um, expand into Active Directory certificate services, right? And you, so you click that box because you want to be safe about your Active Directory. So of course you're going to implement PKI um, and it's free. So why wouldn't you? You hit your next, 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 next. Bam, now you got a CA, you're good to go. You can issue certs inside of Active Directory. You're more secure, except for your CA is vulnerable, you know, out of the box. So it's these kind of things with Active Directory that makes it so hard for uh, administrators, especially newer administrators or ones who are not as keen to some of these, these uh, new vulnerabilities that we keep finding. I mean, just month over month, especially around certificate services. So it's, it's, it's really, really interesting. Um, what I will say to anybody who's interested in Active Directory out there or maybe application security out there, just constantly, constantly learn, read um, about everything. Anything that, anything that interests you, it's, it's all valid. It all comes in handy. You may not think that it's gonna come in handy today until you decide that you need to run a script or, or create some solution to something and you're like, oh, well, well, I know how those two pieces work. Um, and, I, and I think that's really what makes strong engineers. You know, it, you don't have to know everything. Um, it, it's more of the ability of, of piecing those, those Lego pieces together to build something than knowing what every single piece does. You know, um, yeah, if you know it, the pieces what, exist, you can get them. And one of the things too is, that, uh, you know, an example with you, you, you know, you have experience in a lot of different areas, but that's also, you know, you, you see so many different examples and, you know, there, it's nice that there are so many different ways of doing it, things that, you know, you kind of pick your own journey. But the cool thing is, too, is to see, you know, a lot of people starting out, you try to learn a little bit about everything. But this also goes to show your background. It's really good to get really good at something, not necessarily say, you know, you maybe you were a specialist, but 
to know something really well, because I mean, that's what helped you break into the industry because you knew a very complex system very well. And so that yep. was helpful. Absolutely. Absolutely. And it's, it's just one of those, I knew a thing, I saw an opportunity and, and I went for that opportunity. Yeah. I, I wasn't sitting at home saying that, Hey, you know, I, I need to change active directory. That wasn't, that wasn't, you know, when I, I woke up thinking about that day. So uh, it was very cool when I saw the opportunity come across because it was, yeah, I can, I can talk to you about active directory all day, but as far as the security, the whole reason why we're having this conversation is because I was watching your video on active directory security. So <laughs> Um, it was it was actually a really cool and uh, humbling experience, and I've learned so much in the last few years over that, uh, be, you know, because of that conversation. Um, but yeah, I mean, you you never know what opportunities are going to uh, arise. So, funny enough, you and I are having this conversation because we have a, a mutual acquaintance, uh, Christoph. So I know Christoph actually um, because of nothing to do with the cyber world. I ran into Christoph in the Bahamas in the beginning of this year. Yep, yep. So he and I were uh, sitting at a bar, having a drink, and uh, you know it, his wife was there, and uh, she was talking to him about something, and and she said something about uh, you know like my husband hacks things or whatever, you know. So of course my my ears peak up, and I'm like, oh, what is, you know what does that mean? And um, we kind of start having this conversation, and I was like, oh, I think we do very similar jobs. And uh, so that that's actually how I met Christoph in the beginning of this year. Um, it, you just never know where those opportunities are going to are going to come up. It's really funny how small a world this is for you to meet him that way. And it's you know you just and that, that's another thing too. We one of the big things that helps people get jobs is networking, and just that's a, just a prime example. So you know, always be listening and always look for opportunities. I mean, it's almost like using the hacker mindset here, see things and take advantage of the opportunities. And, and so yep. that, that's pretty amazing that you met him on vacation somewhere. So that's, yeah. Yeah. Pretty 100%, interesting. 100%. Yeah. And, I, and what I will say is, you know, I've, I've bumped into a few people kind of out in the wild. Um, and most of the time, I mean, I've never had an issue going up to somebody and like, you know, kind of having a quick powwow, but Oh, like, what do you do? How'd you get into that? Are you guys hiring? What, if, if I was interested in your company, what, you know, a piece of advice could you give me if I want to do what you do? You know, that kind of a thing. And usually people are, are pretty open. They give you 30 seconds of like, uh, you know, of what's inside their brain. And sometimes that's the golden ticket uh, because we all know it's, it's, it, it was kind of hard for all of us to get into security. Um, it's, it's, it's weird. It's getting easier. There's more of a direct path, but I think until about a couple of years ago, there wasn't really a direct path. You kind of fell into it because of a need somewhere. You know, so. Yeah, that's one of the things, too, that, you know, although you're mentioning all this information about how you started and and, you know, I kind of started similar. But, well, you know, for the people listening, this doesn't mean that you have to start out as a sysadmin or whatever. You can you can jump right into it. And it's more more viable option now, because whenever I started out in 97 as a sysadmin, I didn't hear of the hear of any jobs for pen testing, and I'm sure they would have been very scarce and would have been hard to get. And so now yeah. someone can train up and learn the trade and jump right in. They don't have to spend five, yeah. 10, 20 years to prep for it. 100%. There's, there are so many um, educational resources that are out there between uh, the academies, the labs online, the uh, books that have been written, <laughs> uh, all, you know, just their resources are, are out there. Whereas, um, I remember when I was first really like digging into uh, some, some uh, network security, well, what I considered to be network security at the time. Uh, one, of, one of the suggested books on the market was like hacking Wi-Fi for dummies. You know what I mean? Like that was, that was on the technical book next to O'Reilly. You know what I mean? Like that was, that was top stuff, but it was also, you know, 1999, you know? <laughs> so uh, a lot of things have changed since then. And uh, what I will say is, you know, uh, in my experience, I've, you know, because I've hired people both on, on the security side as well as on uh, the IT side and in academia as well as, you know, privatized and things like that. Um, from what I have found, uh, Ed, uh, I would say that your drive, your drive and, and the effort that you put into yourself and, uh, you know, you're, you are your own product. So the effort that you put into yourself, um, that it shows, you know, what you do in your free time 
matters. You know, if you maybe don't have uh, a college degree, but, you know, in, in your free time, you've been taking down some labs or uh, you, you volunteer your time to, to help fix networking at, at, I don't know, the local rec or something like that. You know, those kind of things, they, they stick out. There are a lot of organizations that have opportunities for volunteers. Um, so I am part of an organization um, called Blacks in Cybersecurity. Uh, you do not have to be black to be part of it. Um, it it's a really cool organization. We are just trying to reach out and um, get more and more people involved, especially people of color um, involved in uh, cybersecurity. And, and just, just so that people know that the opportunity is there. Um, it does seem like that wall is, is so high and, and you can feel very fenced off, um, but it, it really is there. Um, you talk to people, get on LinkedIn, send messages, get on Twitter, uh, read on stuff. And, and one of the things that I think really goes a long way is, you know, create a Twitter page or like, and, and I'm not, I'm not telling anybody how to live their life. It's just one of the things that I, I have seen that seems to be successful uh, for people is, you know, you create some kind of a blog platform, right? Whether it's Twitter or, or, or whatever it is. And as you, as you go off and you decide to learn something, you know, today I'm going to learn about the BGP protocol. So you read about BGP protocol for two or three hours, right? And then put some slides together. What did you learn? Right. Put that on your blog, maybe write about it, maybe release a short video. And, um, you know, after a couple of months, you've got quite a bit of content that's there. So, you know, when you sit down for that first interview or maybe the 50th interview, whatever it is, you've got a portfolio of information and knowledge that not only that you have, that's in a format that's ready to share with other people. And, and like it, it goes, it goes a long way, I think. That's some great advice because a lot of times you hear people talk about doing content creation, creating a blog and stuff to get to help their efforts getting hired. But the way you put it together, that's, that's really great advice. And I think that that's something I haven't really heard anyone reference, you know, that detail, but that's, that's pretty good. That's, and it's amazing how the opportunities like content creation, people doing a blog, people making YouTube videos yep. or all this content creation. I mean, there's people that basically that's kind of where they got their in because yep. they had a blog, you know, they were writing stuff on medium or they're, posting up videos and that kind of gets them connected. And, you know, one of the things hiring managers are going to see is, you know, it looks like, you know, what you're doing technically, you know, they see your communication skills through your writing, how you're communicating that. And that, that's all good stuff. Yep. Yep. 100%. 100%. Um, another thing I'll say too is in the security world, uh, in my experience, um, formal education is, um, it, it can't, depending on what you're doing, can be be uh, less important, um, and it, because it's not necessarily about knowledge. Uh, my my opinion of 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 college isn't necessarily to make you smart, right? It's to help you organize your thoughts so that when you know in the future you you need to research something, you understand the process in order to go out and research that. Some people are autodidacts, or they're just really good at doing that on their own, or you know, and that's fine. Uh, you, you see a lot of researchers that have no problem locking themselves up for a weekend. They come back with this, this amazing work, you know? Um, so I have seen all kinds of people with all kinds of interesting backgrounds in the security, in the security world. And a lot of times their backgrounds are not security. You know, I've seen lawyers and teachers and, you know, they were housewives, uh, just, just random, random backgrounds where either they were interested in something or something in their life changed. And uh, they decided to, to pick up a book learn a subject and, um, you know, start a new career. Um, so, you know, I, I think it's, it's really attainable um, if it's something that you want to do. Now, on the IT side, depending on what, it's, what you're doing on the IT side, right, let's say you want to be a database admin or a, a network admin. I don't think you necessarily have to go to school for 10 years, but I do think that it, or a, com a computer programmer. I do think, though, that formalized, standardized training of some sort, at least in the beginning, is going to take you a lot, a lot further because there's a lot of information, foundational knowledge that you really got to crunch in there um, before you can have fun with some of those subjects. So um, with security, you can kind of pick and choose the pieces that you like and uh, you, you expand on that because, you know, every, every, uh, every object um, inside of an enterprise has value. And because of that, it needs to be secure. So you're interested in something, figure out how that aligns with what, what it is that uh, you want to do. 
Yeah, and a nice thing too when you're, you're talking about mentioning some of the IT skills. Just you know, a lot of times industry knowledge. So if you worked for a bank and maybe you were just a teller at a bank, if you understand like the financial industry, understanding that business somewhat will help you in roles. Because I mean, one of the things that helped me in my career is I worked for a mortgage company for 14 years, so I got a lot of interest from financial institutions because of working that business back, having that background. But a lot of times you may not have to know it that much in depth, but just Working in that area makes you know you attractive as an employee for one of those companies. Yep, one hundred percent, one hundred percent. Also, also too. I mean, another thing to keep in mind is, from a security standpoint, you know, not everybody is super technical, and um, not all security roles are uh, technical in the same way. Uh, there are a lot of roles where it's all about personality. There's a lot of roles where you know social engineering skills um, and empathy go a long way, uh, especially. And, and you know what? Actually, I'll, I'll bring up pen testing, right? Because so I'm not a pen tester. I have no experience with pen testing. Um, and I do think that there's some soft skills that are required with pen testing, for instance, that are not required with red teaming. You know, red teaming, you go in, you have your target, you break some stuff you, and, and, you know, you get out. With, with pen testing, sh- sure, you broke some stuff, but, but that COO, yeah, I mean, they don't, they don't want to hear that you broke some stuff. You know, they want... They want that beautiful report. They want the layout as to like, what, what did you find? How do we fix this? You know, like that's what they want. They want the report. And um, you got to be able to put on those white gloves and, and hand it to them, you know, so a lot more soft skills and, um, and, and that type of field. So I actually watched, um, what is that? Uh, Red Sieges podcast on Wednesday. And they had a, a red teamer um, in Brazil and she's a physical red teamer. Uh, so she knows nothing about computers, nothing. <laughs> so I really shouldn't say nothing uh, like that. That's what she says, right? She knows nothing about computers, but you know, I'm sure she can pick every lock in your house. Uh, and she was talking about going on an engagement and that was one of her most fun engagements. And, and uh, literally she knocked on a door it, it had a keypad, uh, digital keypad it was intense, but she knocked on the door. Somebody opens the door. She says she's with it. They let her walk to every single computer and she just, puts in her, her, her thumb drive to every computer that's there and then, you know, makes her phone call to the boss and, and gets out of there, but required absolutely no technical skills, uh, you know, so, uh, and she loves what she does. And um, those, those types of pin tests are also incredibly important. And you see those a lot with banks and prisons and all kinds of places. So you don't necessarily have to be a computer person to be a security person. Yeah, that's, that's good points. And it's, it's just interesting too, because some people that, may not do well in social situations, may have a hard time with social engineering, but if they're doing like a fishing campaign or something that may be a little bit easier. So, you know, there's, there's like something for every personality because I mean, trying to maintain composure under pressure while you're trying to talk your way in to some place can, can be nerve wracking. It's funny because I heard a talk at NOLACON in 2019, these guys specialized in social engineering and physical pen testing. And they talked about that all their stuff that they had in their kit. And one of the things that they carried with them was the candy bar, because once they pulled off getting into the building, there was such an adrenaline rush and such a flood of these <laughs> of nervousness and stuff. They would go to the bathroom, sit there, calm down, collect their nerves, eat yep. something so they can get their blood sugar up and then continue on because just the, the pressure, but some people that's not that big of a deal, you know? Yep. Yeah. Yeah. I've got a, a buddy of mine that um, I'm actually looking forward to uh, DEF CON because uh, we, we tend to go out and um, we, we do a bunch of social engineering bets and, and uh, it can get qu- quite interesting to see how far you can get to places and uh, you end up having really interesting conversations with people. And uh, it, it's, it's a lot of fun, a lot of fun. Um, as long as you keep your head nice, cool and calm and don't do anything stupid. <laughs> So yeah, what what just kind of curious, I kind of have an idea. You kind of touched on certifications a little bit, but do you think certifications are required for someone to get started? Um no. Uh I don't think they're required. Uh I do think they're useful. Uh and I will say that if you do not have a degree, I personally would say get a certification. Um at at and I'm not gonna say you should get this one over that one necessarily, but at minimum just just get a certification because the, the thing about it is it's not so much that, you know, your certification is going to prove that you're an expert here or an expert there, but it proves that on, you know, in your own free time, you went out to go learn something 
then you, you paid some money to go out to go test to prove that you know this thing. Um, so that's really, that's really what I'm looking for is, is, is the effort that you put into it. Um, you know, I w- but I would say that certifications can definitely give you a leg up. Um, and depending on what it is that you want to do, there are certain certifications that stick out much more than others, you know? So that's also something to keep in mind. Um, I have people that ask me about, you know, you know, which, what's the best cert I should get, you know, should I get pen test plus, should I, you know, get OSCP, should I get uh, CEH? Um, and it, it depends. Honestly, it, it really does depend. And you have to kind of do your research as to what it is that you're interested in, you know, what kind of jobs that you're interested in, right? Um, look at, look at those, look, look at the requirements and look at what certifications that the jobs that you're interested in are, are, are uh, asking for, because they may not be what you think they are, you know, or they may be, they may not be at the level that they, that you think they are, right? They may only be looking for associate level um, certifications, right? So you don't necessarily need to bust your chops for a professional level certification, get in with your associates level certification, get trained on the job and let your job send you and hopefully pay for your next levels of certifications, you know? Um, so that's, uh, I would definitely say that uh, certifications are the reason why I was, I've never had an issue uh, really getting a job in either in IT um, or since I've moved over to um, cybersecurity, but uh, I've got, I've got those certifications that do prove that I know a lot of different things about a lot of different things. Um, and I like that. I like to keep my certifications kind of diverse um, because you can, I can dabble in a lot of different stuff. Um, so I, if I had two candidates, uh, one candidate was a, a college um, a college graduate, but that's it. Just college grad, computer science or something. I don't know. That's it. And then I have another kid who didn't uh, graduate college at all, but he's got uh, OSCP, CEH, and I don't know, Security Plus or something like that. Um, I'm probably going to have a deeper conversation at least initially with the, the, the kid who has just the certifications, right? Because it's like, what was, what were your pathway? Cause I know with the kid who went to college, I know his pathway. Like I know how he got to learn what he learned, but there's a, there's a curriculum for that. You, I can go online. I can look at your college and, and I can see exactly what courses you took. Now it's all about just personality. Do you fit? Did you, do you actually meet what, what, you know, your degree says that you do? Um, with this other kid, I don't really have that. However, what I do have is I have a standardized um, metric uh, of knowledge, right? Because, the, you know, there's a lot of people that have degrees, right? And some of them had a 4.0 and some of them had a 2.0, right? So you got a big, a big gap there, right? As far as where you can go. With, um, with certifications, some of, those, some, of those, uh, some of those gaps for the certifications those are, are very slim. Some of them are just go or no go. Uh, you get into some of those offensive security certs and it's, it's all hands on, it's all hands on. Um, you know, so it's, you know, from a, it, it will prove you beyond just a theoretical. So I, I definitely think that they have a lot of merit. And if you use them for what it is that you're trying to do, um, that they, they can go a long, a, a long way, but definitely keep in mind that there are some certs that resonate more with HR teams and some certs that resonate more with your technical teams. And so I would, my recommendation is like, like I said, figure out what it is that you like to do, the job roles that sound cool to you, and then look at the certifications that those people have or that they're looking for you to have for those job roles. Uh, great advice. So what are your views? Cause I get the, all the time people want to getting, get into industry are always asking, do I need to learn how to code? And sometimes this is where they're talking actually C or whatever, C sharp, or even to like scripting. So what are, you, what are your opinions on that? If someone is wanting to get into the industry, do they need that to start? Oh, no, you don't need it to start. Definitely not. Um, if you're, if you're going to be on the technical side, especially if you're going to be on the offensive side, on the technical side, it's going to come up. Uh, eventually, you're going to dabble in Python at minimum. Um, if you're going to get into custom payloads and stuff, you're probably going to dabble in C Sharp or something. If you're doing reversing, you're going to get into assembly and that kind of thing. Like you can't, you can't avoid it. It's, it's, it's a part of breaking something is, uh, you know, taking it down to its smaller parts and that's, that's code. So, um, but definitely not required going in. And there's, again, there's a lot of different jobs in security and not all of them are technical. Not all of them require coding at all. 
uh, uh, for instance, in, in you know, my, my day-to-day uh, routine, you know, I do a lot of security assessments and stuff like that. I, it involves no code at all. Uh, so that, that part of my job requires absolutely no code at all. Um, I don't really start touching code and stuff until it gets into the threat emulation and, and that piece of my job. Once I start creating labs and dealing with Terraform and, and, and get into that kind of stuff. But um, yeah, for my, for my day-to-day, just doing assessments and such, no, I don't, I don't deal with any code at all. So uh, it, it's absolutely not uh, required. Um, however, I will say that incre- it's incredibly useful. And again, um, kind of understanding what your goals are in your career uh, can kind of steer you as to what languages you may want to start with. So I started as a blue teamer. I started in IT. So I would say that I didn't even really start touching any programming languages till about 2017 or so, 20, yeah, 2017, and it was PowerShell. Right, I started automating everything with PowerShell because I was an administrator and, and I mean, you can do so much stuff with it. It was cool. Um, you start creating enough custom things with PowerShell, you can't help but running to, run into .NET. Um, so I was doing a lot of PowerShell stuff, a lot of .NET stuff. And then we had a developer um, who was really good with, um, he was really good with PHP and Python. And he and I did some interesting kind of like hybrid stuff with his web servers and, and my backend Windows servers and that kind of stuff. But um, that was that was really how I first kind of got into languages, and it's it's very interesting because I, I don't feel like I sat down and studied programming or anything at really at any point in time, um, aside from actually what I'm literally doing now. But um, it was just I I did a couple of tasks per a couple of tasks per day, and then you do a couple of more and a couple of more, and then you you become the guy who knows PowerShell, and you just you know your scripts become better and more efficient and longer and and. Uh, you realize like, oh, I, I actually know this language now. Um, that being said, I have created all kinds of uh, different solutions and, and weird stuff with APIs and stuff with PowerShell. I'm a, a, a strong believer in living off the land. So I spent a lot of time in the PowerShell world. Um, so on my desk stand right now, actually, I have a C++ book as well as a .NET book uh, because I'm brushing up on um, some of the payloads and some reversing stuff um, right now. So you never stop learning. Um, you're always dabbling, uh, but to answer your question, no, definitely not required uh, to get into it. But if you're gonna if you're gonna be offensive, the more offensive you are and the more technical you are, um, you can't really avoid it. And I, I will say that about all skill sets, no matter what it is, uh, it, if it involves technology, if the more offensive that you become, the more things that you're gonna need to know because you don't know what's gonna be behind that next door. You don't know if uh, that next system is gonna be a database. Well, what if you don't like databases, right? You don't know if that's going to be a Linux box, but what if what if you've only practiced, you know, you know pwning um, Windows boxes, uh, web services? You know, there's there's all kinds of, of possibilities that are there. So it's just about you know becoming that Swiss Army knife of technology and just adding more tools to your belt. You know, so I would say it's not it's not necessarily a question of do you need it. It's a question of is it useful. If so, why wouldn't you have it, right? Throw it in the toolbox. Yeah, very, very, very good to get your your point of view because it's really interesting. I had Alyssa Knight on here and she doesn't know how to code, which someone that's a hacker at her level really surprised me that she didn't know how to code and then kind of starting out when she did. So it's always interesting to hear that. But one of the things I always ask a question is so, you know, the listeners that are, you know, listening to the episodes kind of realize, okay, this doesn't have to stop me from starting. I can get in to the role and I can learn coding if I need to, or if I want to. So, you know, a lot of times I think people put up too many things blocking them from, you know, trying to get started. Yeah. I see, I see internships all the time that pop up. Um, There are, like I said, there's a lot of communities join these communities on discord and uh, Twitter, LinkedIn, um, and just, just be active. Don't be scared to speak up. And uh, again, ask questions. You never know. Um, especially if you're, you're new starting out, I would say, you know, my, my advice, if you don't, you have nowhere, you don't know where to start at all is, uh, look up CompTIA security plus pick up a a CompTIA security plus book. See if you still like it. If you like it, pick the cert. It's a very, it's a relatively cheap cert, um, multiple choice and, uh, you know, go for an internship. Once you, once you have that certain hand, go for an internship for six months, you know? And, and see what you like. Get your hands on some things. See, you know. 
So we're getting down toward, towards the end of the show. Is there anything you'd like to share that we haven't discussed? Uh, not really. Well, so at the end of this year, I will be speaking at uh, the Experts Conference in September. I will also be at uh, Wild Wild West in October. And uh, you can catch uh, Active Directory Hacking Village at uh, Blue Team Con this year, as well as uh, the Expert Conference and at Hackers Teaching Hackers. So busy for the next few months, but uh, I'm around. Feel free to come up to me, come up to my booth. Um, if you ever see me at Active Directory Hacking Village, if you ever see the uh, Trimark booth, come up to us, talk to us. Feel free to talk to me about anything. If you have any questions about anything, um, love to talk. Well, thanks. Thanks for, for being a guest and for everyone uh, listening to this episode. Uh, we will have his uh, social media links in the show notes to Twitter and LinkedIn. So I'm sure he would be happy to answer your questions and connect with you. So, you know, as we kind of mentioned the networking part, always be met networking so that it's an opportunity for you to connect. Thanks again for, for being a guest. And I appreciate you taking time out of your busy schedule. Thank you. Thanks, everyone, and we'll see you on the next episode. BugCrowd's award-winning platform combines actionable contextual intelligence with the skill and experience of the world's most elite hackers to help leading organizations identify and fix vulnerabilities, protect customers, and make the digitally connected world a safer place. Learn more at bugcrowd.com. We hope you enjoyed this episode of the Hacker Factory Podcast with Philip Wiley. If you learned something new and this podcast made you think, then share ITSBmagazine.com with your friends, family, and colleagues. If you represent a company and wish to associate your brand with our conversations, sponsor one or more of our podcast channels. We hope you will come back for more stories and follow us on our journey. You can always find us at the intersection of technology, cybersecurity, and society.